idea of economic cooperation and integration in East Asia is not new. The United States supported Trans-Pacific Partnership and Chinese supported Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership provide competing movements toward deeper integration. However, if the issue of regional economic integration becomes enmeshed in a broader Sino-American competition, a future East Asian Economic Union may be increasingly unlikely. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope we had a nice lunch, even though you know we had a very a limited time for lunch. And this afternoon, uh, we're going to talk about the East Asian uh, economic regionalism. As you know, uh, recently there have been a very uh, significant uh, improvement or advancement uh, in terms of uh, economic integration in East Asia. In fact, uh, last November, uh, two very important uh, events uh, took place at least in terms of uh, East Asia economic integration. Uh, both the RCEP, Regional FTA in East Asia called RCEP, uh, Regional, economic, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, led by uh, ASEAN, and uh, trilateral uh, FTA among three uh, Northeast Asian uh, countries, uh, that is uh, CJKFTA, were launched in Phnom Penh. So now we are entering a kind of new era uh, to the to have a regional wide FTA in East Asia finally, and on top of that, uh, there are other uh, FTA talks going on. And as you know, for example, uh, FTA, uh, bilateral FTA between uh, China and Korea uh, was underway. Actually, there have been uh, five rounds of FTA talks. Another thing is, it's not just the you know, last one, but a very important thing is in the Asia Pacific, we have the TPP. Uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which have been quite active, and the, the importance of uh, TPP was risen uh, recently after the announce of Japanese government uh, last month to uh, join the uh, TPP uh, negotiation. So there are many uh, competing ideas or frameworks uh, are going on in East Asia or in the Pacific. Uh, so, I think we have a four panelists here. Uh, I will introduce uh, momentarily. And we'll, I'll ask those four uh, panelists uh, about, you know, two questions. First, are these uh, competing ideas of region-wide and uh, sub-regional uh, economic integration in East Asia working together for economic integration in East Asia or at a cross purposes? And secondly, what are the future prospects of, for uh, different uh, frameworks such as RCEP that I mentioned and CJKFTA and TPP uh, in addition to uh, ASEAN economic integration uh, going for uh, East Asia, uh, ASEAN uh, economic uh, community, uh, which, I mean, whose uh, target year is uh, uh, year 2015. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our four panelists. I'm not kind of, I feel a little bit awkward with this digital era. Uh, <laughs> so, 
The first uh, panelist will be uh, Dr. An uh, Dr. Nan, uh, who is a professor of international trade and law and policy at the Seoul National University uh, Graduate School of International uh, Studies. Uh, then we have uh, Nakajima uh, Kimoyoshi Zhang, uh, who is a senior fellow in the uh, research division at the uh, Economic Research uh, Institute uh, for uh, Northeast Asia called ARENA. Then we have uh, Professor Gilbert Roseman, who is a uh, Musgrave Professor of Sociology at Princeton University. Uh, he has taught at Princeton uh, University since 1970. So maybe some of you were not born at that time. <laughs> so, and he has been following uh, uh, Northeast Asian affairs uh, for a long, long time. And our last speaker, uh, last panelist, will be uh, Dr. Zhao Kuansheng. Uh, Dr. Zhao is a professor of international relations and director of the Center for Asian Studies at American University. Okay, so uh, given uh, time constraint, I like to uh, invite uh, Dr. An first. Okay, thank you very much. Um, First, let me address the, uh, uh, the compatibility between RCEP and TPP, uh, already alluded by uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, the East Asian economies uh, draw a lot of attention nowadays because uh, recently economists found that uh, the predominant portion of global supply chain actually took place in East Asia. Uh, if you think about like Latin America or Africa or Middle East or uh, this, the, the Russian region, actually nothing much uh, was changed. Uh, but a significant portion of East Asian economic uh, integration were actually uh, interpreted as global supply chain. So uh, this area is indeed the central part of the recent phenomena uh, known as global supply chain. So... Uh, this reason drew a lot of attention in, in that regard. And then here suddenly we have uh, two very big mega FTAs are competing here. Uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, ASEAN Plus 6 basically, uh, versus TPP. Now, uh, under the leadership of the, the United States, 11 countries are now trying to launch major 21st new model for economic integrations. At the same time, the ASEAN plus six country, as, you, as uh, uh, some of you are, uh, are already aware, ASEAN already have FTA with six countries, uh, China, Japan, Korea, and Australia, New Zealand, plus India. So they try to basically integrate, embrace all these reasons under one umbrella. Uh, the idea was, well, probably simply just uh, incorporating all these already existing FTA can probably help something to uh, make more progress toward uh, economic integration. But then the RCEP area, uh, original the aim was relatively low. Uh, we didn't try to have very serious economic integration there. Particularly if you think about the uh, uh, the participants here, India, China, and then many ASEAN countries, they may not embrace very significant economic integration there. So we thought that this area is relatively easy uh, economic integration effort, initiatives, uh, whereas TPP is really serious economic integrations, uh, setting forth the new model for the uh, coming future. But the problem is, it turned out that almost half of RCEP and TPP participants are actually overlapped. So, uh, almost half of the ASEAN uh, countries plus Australia, Australia New Zealand, um, and Japan. And Brunei. Yeah, yeah. the half of yeah, the yeah, ASEAN yeah, countries. Right. The Japan, Australia, New Zealand are now participate, participating into TPP. So suddenly, just a two-track approach doesn't seem to make sense. So 
this current situation will raise very interesting problems. Probably, uh, unlike the original intention or aim, uh, the, R the RCEP negotiation probably uh, tried to embrace much higher level of economic integrations. But in any case, the how to coordinate these two seemingly contradicted two uh, economic integration initiatives uh, will be quite an interesting issue uh, for the coming years. Um, the second uh, issue, whether all these uh, divergent economic integration initiatives uh, may be feasible. Um, well, if you look at all those FTA initiatives individually, it doesn't look very promising because, like, U.S. now launched FTA with European unions, and then European Union launched FTA with Japan, and Korea, Japan, China tried to have trilateral FTAs. Individually, probably we can think of a numerous a myriad of difficulties and obstacles there. But for the first time in history, all these mega FTAs are uh, presented at the same time in the table. So everything now looks like chess games. So uh, here, uh, what it matters is actually uh, the strategic rivalry. Uh, if we consider that kind of uh, the trade politics, uh, here, the really important key for uh, uh, provoking a lot of strategic rivalry uh, will be Korea-China FTA. Uh, it is very likely that Korea-China uh, will be able to conclude this FTA. Uh, if not by the end of next year, probably the early 2015 might be feasible, uh, the due date for the conclusion of uh, this FTA. But then, uh, the next, well, originally, we thought that this uh, bilateral FTA might be expanded to include Japan, but recently we have a lot of issues with <laughs> Japan, so we have to think about uh, what will happen. Uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure that in case the Korea China conclude FTA, then uh, probably the new players will appear in the scene. Uh, that is uh, so far completely ignored. That is Taiwan. Chinese Taipei will probably emerge as another player in uh, this East Asian uh, economic play playground because uh, it seems that the, uh, the Chinese government seems to allow ta Taiwan, Chinese Taipei, to follow its own steps, like they allow Taiwan to join WTO after they uh, made an accession to the WTO. So sooner or later, Singapore and Taiwan will announce FTA uh, officially, and then uh, Chinese Taipei is also uh, is negotiating FTAs with several uh, ASEAN countries. So uh, probably uh, there is a very strong chance for ta the Chinese Taipei to appear in the scene sooner or later, um, and then probably at that point in time. Uh, the current position of the Japanese government toward this, uh, the regional FTA might be substantially changed. Um, so if that happens, then it will provoke a lot of country in the world. Uh, Korea-China FTA or uh, a little bigger uh, FTA embracing Chinese Taipei or, or even uh, the Japan, then uh, something probably will try to happen uh, between US, EU, or TPP, or even RCEP area. So everything is now clicking. So uh, maybe five years ago, when we talked about the East Asian economic regionalism, it was more of like a the theoretical uh, thought experiment. But at this moment, uh, I believe the situation is very different and then uh, a lot uh, may hinge on the, the outcome of Korea-China FTA. So I'll stop here uh, later. I'll okay, so questions. maybe it's turn for Nakajima-san to... Thank you. Uh, <coughs> um, I think uh, the reason I was uh, invited as a speaker here is uh, organizer uh, need some uh, Japanese perspective 
on East Asian economic uh, integration issue. And uh, already Dr. Uh, Professor Ang made a very detailed uh, explanation about uh, TPP and RCIP. So I would like to begin uh, about uh, Japanese uh, viewpoint. And uh, <clears throat> you may know, uh, in 1990s, uh, in Europe, uh, they have uh, EU, and uh, in North America, they had uh, NAFTA. But uh, compared to them, East Asia was much behind in the sense of institutional economic integration. De facto uh, uh, economic integration, uh, we had very high intra-regional trade uh, and uh, FDIs, but even though we didn't have any system to organize it. But, uh, uh, and I think there are some reasons, but one of them were uh, rivalry between Japan and China. And I think uh, Dr. Li Chanje uh, knows uh, the detail much more than me, but uh, there are long uh, history about uh, uh, conflict between two uh, ideas, ASEAN plus three, uh, EAFTA, uh, which means ASEAN plus uh, China, Japan, uh, Korea, and ASEAN plus six, which, was, which used to be called uh, SEPIA, C-E-P-A, uh, uh, it's uh, ASEAN plus six, uh, CJK plus uh, New Zealand, Australia, India. Uh, but after uh, Japanese participation to uh, TPP negotiation, uh, I don't mean just a, a statement uh, which Abe administration did made uh, last month, but also uh, during uh, uh, former another administration's policy, uh, which means uh, approaching to uh, take part in TPP, uh, gave a uh, serious impact to China's FTA policy. For example, uh, the, the largest example is uh, that ASEAN plus three and six. Finally, uh, China and Japan agreed uh, to begin new uh, negotiation, which is called RCIP. But in reality, it is ASEAN plus six. So in that sense, uh, China walked to uh, Japanese side, which was the uh, impact of TPP. If uh, Japan uh, took part only in TPP, it will be uh, a disadvantage for Chinese uh, FTA policy. So. Uh, I think Japanese uh, policy uh, change uh, made uh, impact on China's uh, policy. And I think a similar point is uh, we can see in uh, CJK, trilateral uh, negotiation, uh, FTA negotiation. Uh, as you may know, uh, now we have uh, many serious troubles uh, between Japan and uh, China. Uh, territorial issue, uh, security issue. But even though they didn't cut a contact in trade negotiation, uh, we didn't have a summit meeting, but uh, we kept a minister level meeting on FTA issue. I think it, is, uh, it shows uh, what uh, China thinks important uh, in East Asia. I think this is it. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so before going to China, uh, since the relationship between uh, China and Japan is so uh, <laughs> tense, so I'll invite uh, uh, Professor Roseman. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Lee. I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm not an economist. I don't have the same economic orientation that our first two presenters have. Uh, but I have been looking at regionalism for about 20 years. And I wrote something on flawed regionalism, looking at different views about strategies for achieving regionalism uh, back in the, around 1997. And I've written a book called Stunted Regionalism, assessing what happened as of 2004, and actually updating that to the last two, three years I would be more pessimistic. 
So putting the economic aspects of regionalism in a broader context, one can express a good deal of doubt about moving beyond certain technical areas of cooperation to something broader. And I would say that it, uh, much depends on how you put the three elements together, economics, security, and what's identified with an East Asian community, some aspects of culture or identity. How do you combine them and see how they proceed? Well, economists have generally said, if we can proceed on the economic front, let's keep the rest as far away as possible. And some of the progress has occurred by that happening. And of course, their economies of scale and complementarities have meant that everybody's benefited. And I don't think that among the specialists looking at the, the, the hopes for putting these different uh, types of FTAs together, uh, or the TPP as well, that they would say there's anything negative about trying to achieve what eventually could be an East Asian FTA, a combination FTA involving uh, East Asia as well as uh, countries uh, in, on the other side of the Pacific. But the problem is that it's very hard to keep economics separate. So in the early 90s, the United States wanted to link uh, most favored nation status with human rights concerns and put pressure on China. And China's position in the 90s was nothing should, be inter should interfere with economics. Economics is pure and separate. But lately, we've seen more and more instances of China linking economics to other elements. And the Chinese discussion of regionalism has more frequently now talked about um, the broader agenda for achieving regionalism and what China's economic uh, clout can do to pressure other countries to go along with China's other objectives, whether it's in withholding rare earth metals or in punishing the Philippines for the territorial dispute by uh, blocking trade in, uh, in imports of bananas or other respects. And of course, Korea has experienced two battles with China over um, uh, garlic and, and other uh, elements. So we, the Koreans know how intense China's pressure can be if it believes the other country is acting uh, in, without China's interest in mind. So my conclusion is we are facing a more difficult environment. The U.S. Now, what are the prospects? I would say that uh, the TPP prospects are uncertain, but probably not low, because the importance of TPP is rising for non-economic reasons. As part of the U.S. rebalancing strategy, we heard a presentation on the previous panel about what the U.S. rebalancing or pivot consists of. But in fact, there's a huge economic component, and it's also trying to steer China's economic development towards more reform, towards more transparency, towards less protection of state-owned enterprises, towards uh, new rules about cybersecurity that affect um, uh, stealing intellectual property rights or, or trade secrets. And so there's a, a new sense of the importance of TPP as a strategy to try to reshape economic ties with an Asia-Pacific component and with uh, effort to try to bring China along in stages. And meanwhile, on the Chinese part, I think their desire for this FTA with South Korea, if not the CJK FTA and the RCEP agreement, is increasingly how to 
make sure that TPP doesn't go forward without something else going forward on the Chinese side. It's also a battle for a different kind of regionalism that China has in mind. So I would say I'm not as optimistic about the, um, the cooperation among these agreements. I think we're in a period of increased competition, but it's possible that some of this competition will actually bring about um, success uh, on one side or both. Stop there. Okay. Okay. Dr. Yeah. Zhao, please. Uh, if we look at the global perspective, uh, among many regional economic integrations, uh, there are three most significant and uh, dynamic. One, uh, Europe Union, and second, North America, NAFTA, and third, East Asia. Uh, economic integration. Uh, unfortunately, if we look at East Asia, uh, it's far like behind. It's most complicated, so a lot of issues involved. Uh, and on the other hand, East Asia is most economically dynamic. If we look at the numbers, figures, uh, so this is, I would say, very significant issue we need to address. Uh, among many issues, uh, I, I guess we have to ask why. Uh, why is Asia uh, regional economic, uh, uh, regionalism integration uh, lag behind? There are a number of things uh, I would like to address. One is the issue of leadership. And two uh, is economics versus politics and security. Uh, those uh, uh, among many reasons. Uh, the first one, uh, issue of leadership, if we look at uh, EU uh, successful experience in a relative term, uh, 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 France and uh, Germany, among others, really play the leading role uh, in terms of uh, promoting regional economic uh, integration. Uh, ideally, in, in this region, China and Japan, if you can work together uh, to provide the leadership and others, uh, but uh, there are just one way to think about that issue. Uh, there, there is another critical player uh, that is the United States uh, in this region. Uh, I would say that there are several types of leadership issues. Uh, one, what I call a dual leadership structure uh, in this region, that is uh, China and the United States emerged uh, as a, some uh, major powers that can provide some kind of leadership in different dimensions. Uh, United States continue to be a dominant power in security, and in uh, political issues dimensions, whereas China uh, emerging uh, to be a influential economic power. If we look at trade and other economic partners, virtually ch China's economic uh, has become a powerhouse. Uh, so uh, these two powers uh, played a sort of, I would say, a due leadership structure. Uh, and then, because of these two powers, as we have heard in the morning, there are conflicts and the cooperation. So what I have said uh, earlier in my other publications, that is there are two sets of three Cs, uh, positive three Cs and negative three Cs between the United States and China. Positive three Cs is a cooperation, coordination and a compromise. Uh, each has to learn how to accommodate to each other's interests. And, and then the negative three Cs uh, is conflict uh, and uh, uh, a competition and, and then confrontation. And each would move to different directions. So that's for one thing. So far, uh, we have seen uh, positive three Cs has prevailed, but then there are always danger of negative three Cs. 
Another set of leadership uh, is uh, China-Japan issue. Uh, as we all understand, economics versus uh, politics, uh, which prevent, prevented the two powers to exercise leadership. Uh, of course, we also have talked about the CJK, and that's turned to the third side, that's so-called ASEAN plus three. Uh, but ASEAN's leadership role uh, basically uh, is in uh, a, a, a pioneer in an early period, but increasingly really need the CJK uh, to exercise leadership. Again, this set of leadership uh, has been delayed and uh, complicated by political and other reasons. Uh, but Right now, we are seeing uh, the, the whole region move toward a kind of uncertain directions, at least for the time being. Ultimately, uh, I would think the whole East Asia will move on. Uh, if we look at the, the early two other, you know, NAFTA, it, it's, it, it's very clear, and then EU model, and uh, ultimately, uh, within the region, uh, China and Japan has to learn from each other. Actually, uh, tomorrow lunchtime, I will be chairing a so-called networking luncheon entitled uh, China-Japan Soft Landing. Uh, so I guess in that particular session, we can have more concrete discussion. I, I'd better stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Zhao. Dr. Zhao mentioned the uh, positive three Cs and uh, negative three Cs. But among the uh, three negative uh, three Cs, as an economist, you know, competition uh, sounds kind of, you know, rather positive than <laughs> negative. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, we, we have, uh, there, you know, as I said, a, a very serious competition going on. And uh, the, Dr. Roseman agreed that it's rather competition. So then uh, we'll have uh, some winner or losers. Uh, that's why maybe the competition is, you know, uh, competition. Uh, so can I ask you uh, to uh, uh, focus more uh, on our competition uh, between uh, newly uh, starting the RCEP, and an already kind of powerful uh, TPP. Uh, it looks like, you know, uh, in the previous session, uh, people talk about the U.S.-China uh, relationship and uh, U.S. kind of resident power and China rising power. And in that sense, although even TPP is not, uh, I mean, uh, solid, but is led by the uh, United States, Although RCEP is not uh, led by China, but uh, by ASEAN, we have an uh, ambassador from Indonesia, <laughs> so actually it's not China, but uh, it's regarded because you know, we have a, a competition going on between the United States and China. Uh, RCEP is kind of led by uh, China. So could you focus on those uh, two uh, uh, frameworks. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Zhao. Uh, thank you for raising mm. this very important issue. Uh, this is indeed what I early mentioned, the issue of leadership. Uh, I'm not sure whether competition is good or bad, but in a way, uh, this is two set of leadership competition. Uh, I agree with you. That is, uh, uh, our side pretty much, uh, I would not say China Led, but I would say uh, China uh, among most influential players, uh, given the, the power, the activity. Uh, so the U.S.-led TPP, uh, at least from Chinese perspective, uh, seen as a sort of competition uh, that for leadership. Uh, so that's one of the questions Rather than, you know, we all understand the TPP primarily mm -hmm. uh, is an economic and mm -hmm. trade and other 
uh, uh, regional issue. Uh, but there are, uh, uh, if not hidden, uh, if not obvious, but hidden agenda uh, is in terms of leadership. Uh, it, it is seen as a, a U.S. effort to gain back its regional leadership through this way. And uh, at least for the time being, China has been excluded uh, from this TPP. Uh, I, I just chatted with uh, Douglas Paul this morning, and uh, he said, well, you know, China may wait for the next 15 years uh, to join TPP. Uh, so, in, in fact, this is exactly the issue. But I would say, ultim ultimately, China and the United States have, have to find a way to accommodate each other for regional issues. One cannot exclude the other power in the region. Okay. Uh, if we just compare TTP with RCEP, uh, on the economic front, we would argue that the TPP discussions are far more advanced. They've gone through so many rounds. Uh, they started with a, a, a nucleus of countries that had a lot of agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, they've expanded. Now they have 40% of the world economy uh, in the discussions. Uh, and, uh, and I think they have leadership. As a real sense, we, we know who's pushing it. Uh, whereas RCEP is an idea that developed in the fall, ASEAN has shown that it's having more trouble with the agreement right now. ASEAN leadership changes from year to year. I'm not saying that RCEP won't make progress. Uh, it's just that the, the, the coming meetings of ASEAN may end up talking a good deal about some of the other issues, such as the East China Sea, which turned out to be such a stum the South China Sea, such a stumbling block last fall. Uh, so I think that TPP has the edge, and, but if TPP falters, it may give some more impetus, impetus for RCEP. Mm -hmm. uh, and RCEP is less about real regionalism than about another step towards further, uh, further FTA. Because it's hard to imagine that on the security issues or the cultural issues, there will be greater consensus because RCEP goes forward, given the problems like just right now between India and China on their borders, and given some of the other problems. So I would say that uh, we're going to see um, TPP first where will that turn out? And then what happens with RCEP will depend on, on that outcome. Actually, uh, I mean, uh, in, in terms of uh, the conclusion of uh, uh, FTA, uh, as, as you mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, TPP uh, already uh, uh, more than, uh, I think, 11 or 40, yeah, I mean, uh, quite a number of uh, negotiations uh, were held, and for uh, RCEP, we'll have a first RCEP uh, uh, talks uh, in, uh, in, uh, in in Brunei uh, next next month. So it's kind of you know kind of it's a newly born a uh, baby, so uh, it's kind of very difficult to uh, compare uh, directly. Uh, but uh, I mean. And although uh, RCEP is regarded by the, uh, uh, m many, especially uh, by many American colleagues when I was in San Diego, uh, along with uh, uh, Dr. Roseman, uh, a lot of people thought that RCEP is you know, kind of led by uh, China, but Japan is kind of quite active in promoting RCEP. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I will uh, attend uh, one uh, seminar conference on RCEP in uh, Jakarta, uh, in coming Sunday, organized by area, uh, funded by uh, Japanese government. So uh, Japan is not really going for just one direction, uh, but still it's kind of confusing whether Japan uh, wants to uh, join a TPV or a RCEP. So uh, could, could you kind of a uh, little bit uh, 
clarify the situation or a, at least, you know, uh, your view? Yeah, okay. Uh, but before that, uh, I would like to mention the uh, difference uh, between TPP and uh, RCEP from the uh, viewpoint of economist. So, uh, as uh, they mentioned themselves, uh, TPP is called 21st century FTA. Uh, so, it includes uh, uh, a lot of uh, advanced uh, or new uh, area for negotiation. Uh, for example, uh, not only uh, trade of goods, but also services, uh, investment, and uh, intellectual property right issue, uh, labor, environmental, and also uh, government procurement. Um, the, the most crucial for China is uh, reform of uh, state-owned enterprises. So, honestly speaking, it is almost impossible uh, to join uh, China to uh, China to join uh, negotiation on this stage. Maybe maybe five years later, what a decade later. But uh, in that sense, uh, China seriously needed uh, alternative choice. That is, my, in my understanding, RCEP. Mm -hmm. So RCEP cannot be that kind of uh, advanced FTA. Uh, not only China, but also India uh, member <laughs> for negotiation. Mm -hmm. So the major part of RCEP will be uh, uh, trade of goods. But it is also important for Japan. If uh, China uh, still have some uh, tariffs and uh, non-tariff uh, barriers to Japan, so we can, if we can remove them uh, through uh, RCEP negotiation, or maybe CJK trilateral uh, FTA, that's, that is very welcome to Japan. Mm -hmm. So for Japanese sense, uh, there is no conflict between RCEP and the TPP. Both of the, them are beneficial for Japanese uh, trade policy and Japanese economy. Okay, so, Atan? Well, yeah, um, I also agree with uh, Professor Rajman's comment. Uh, there are strong elements for the competition here. Uh, but the, the situation is uh, all, all these players, the economy, the countries, or FTAs, are competing against each other, but the end, end outcome looks mm -hmm. like kind of the cooperations. So uh, RCEP, TPP, currently it looks like they are competing, but as I uh, explained earlier, uh, almost half of the member countries are now overlapped. So in case TPP is making a significant progress, probably RCEP here, they will also try to follow. Also, in case the RCEP made the progress, they will also provoke the TPP, mm -hmm. uh, the movement. So, uh, by this kind of strategic rivalry, as I repeatedly uh, m mentioned, uh, this, the, the strategic rivalry in the global scale will provoke each other. But in the end, the result is basically we try to liberalize more of our trade. So, economically, uh, more of the countries are integrated. Um, the, but the one, one thing to note is uh, the RCEP, uh, as uh, explained already earlier by other colleagues here, uh, we all believe that the RCEP uh, will be much easier task because we uh, don't try to aim very high. But as I mentioned, suddenly the whole dynamics uh, appears to be very different from the original design. Uh, we, we never thought that the half of the, the, the RCEP member country actually tried to adopt TPP models. Mm -hmm. Also at the same time, in case RCEP uh, resulted in uh, the, the outcome with very low level market liberalization, basically there is no purpose of uh, wasting all those uh, resources. Particularly if you think about Japan, for example. Japan is negotiating with now TPP, EU, and then Korea, China, Japan, FTA, and then RCEP. So Japan is doing everything. And then if RCEP is not making any significant progress, then there is no point and no resources to invest in, in these uh, initiatives. Mm -hmm. So uh, in order for RCEP to make meaningful progress, they have to be able to come up with what is the value for their uh, negotiation. Otherwise, simply gathering 
at the same place and then signing some documents doesn't mean anything. Um, so we uh, seem to have very, very uh, different situations. Uh, f uh, f uh, although we actually envisioned uh, all this FT strategy uh, a few years ago uh, with some different picture. Okay, so at this point, I I'd like to open the floor. And so, okay, gentlemen over there. Uh, could you identify yourself first and ask questions? Uh, thank you for your uh, great speech. And my name is Ho Jin Yoon, and I'm a first Asan Young Fellow. And as we already know, uh, nowadays Japan, Abe government has been taking a very aggressive current policy. And uh, the value of yen has been rapidly decreased, and it is uh, about 30% of last year's. And Japan's this, uh, current policy uh, enormous, uh, enormously affects neighboring countries' economic policy. And I, I think that it will be a great impediment for regional economic uh, integration. And my question is that how each Asian country has to uh, deal with uh, Japanese current policy to integrate the uh, regional economic interests? Thank you. Well, that is kind of a hard question. I, 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 I Okay, so uh, who will respond? I, I think it's, you know, being a, a Japanese, uh, Nakajima-san <laughs> is the kind of natural person to defend, I mean, to answer, but he is not an economist. I mean, he doesn't uh, not know everything <laughs> about the uh, Japanese economy, but then maybe uh, could be helped, especially uh, China is kind of very critical, uh, or a, a Korea is also critical uh, to that, in that sense, so, I mean, I mean Nakajima-san, you uh, can yeah, just but, uh, start then. But uh, uh, when we got uh, a lot of uh, appreciation uh, on our currency, uh, no one did not mention. When we have depreciation, <laughs> you know, other countries began to <laughs> criticize it. So I think it's, it's the purpose of... Uh, uh, current uh, monetary policy uh, by BOJ is not uh, uh, manipulate uh, exchange rate, but uh, more uh, domestic uh, economic uh, growth. So uh, we cannot say uh, when we got uh, appreciation, uh, you took that advantage, especially in Korea, uh, got. Uh, a lot of advantage in the uh, market of uh, uh, electronics or automobiles. Mm -hmm. So the situation is the same. So I think naturally, <laughs> I think the doctor should um, defend. Well, nowadays everybody is doing that. <laughs> so we did that at uh, the beginning period of the Lee myung government. Mm -hmm. And then currently US and EU are doing the uh, that the same uh, kind of policy. So, um, uh, but uh, something I worry is basically uh, during the past decade, the U.S. had huge trouble to uh, discipline China for their exchange rate policies. In U.S. Congress, there are numerous uh, the the laws. Actually, the proposals were made by politicians to punish the China in terms of the exchange rate policies. Uh, but then suddenly, uh, it appears that Japan, <laughs> that actually <laughs> did very successfully and very shockingly mm. uh, the manipulate, uh, well, utilize or take advantage of these exchange rate policies. So uh, if the current situation uh, could not be resolved uh, sooner or later, then probably uh, the U.S. will lose huge credibility to criticize the China's exchange policy, mm. uh, and then there will be a huge issue. Mm. Um, and but basically, uh, since the the Asian financial crisis period, uh, uh, very surprisingly, the world economy has been uh, has witnessed very uh, surprising new phenomena with a huge volatility of exchange rate market. So the volatility of exchange rate was just too large uh, to cope with 
uh, with trade policies. Like uh, with the trade FT policy, F FT negotiation, after we eliminated like five six percent of tariffs in U.S. market, thirty percent exchange rate <laughs> depreciation just wiped out entire FT benefits. So uh, that's the danger and the importance of the exchange rate issue yeah, for economic integration or economic uh, initiatives. Okay, so any, any of you? I'll just add that if there's one issue that might be the stumbling block of the TPP between the United States and Japan, uh, and from the United States' point of view, it's the automobile sector. And the car industry in the United States is, is very nervous about that. And this uh, change in the value of the yen has only added to that pressure mm -hmm. in the U.S. Congress to be careful about going forward with Japan. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, the Abenomics issue, uh, because China has its own currency issue, so uh, the currency policy uh, is not really high in uh, China's uh, relations with Japan, but there are many, obviously, other issues. But rather, uh, China's concern, if, if, if I may recall some comments, is uh, this Abenomics policy is primarily for like near-term gain, like uh, July election, among others, uh, and whether this kind of economic recovery uh, can be sustainable. So that's a major question. Obviously, uh, uh, Japan's economic slowdown is not good. If happen again, it's not good to the region. So that's the question. Yeah. Uh, okay, so actually, uh, re regarding that, that the uh, Japanese uh, abenomics, uh, uh, my personal concern is not re really uh, the currency issue, uh, as Dr. Han mentioned, that you know, a lot of other countries uh, did that. Uh, but the uh, you know, side effect of that a kind of quantitative easing of uh, you know, Japan, if you double uh, your you know, monetary mass uh, you know, within two years, uh, a large chunk of that money will go out abroad, uh, including you know, Korea and China. And so I think that could uh, provoke, I mean, it, 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 it won't be that serious when it enter to emerging economies. But sooner or later, those money, I mean, that money will, should come out. Then it could kind of uh, destabilize those emerging economies. So uh, that is my kind of personal concern. Uh, and I have, I saw one hand over there. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lee. Uh, you know, I was a member of APEC Business Advisory Council until last year, you know, uh, so before I got assignment to come to Korea. Uh, and I was also co-chair of the Regional uh, Integration Working Group, you know, at the APEC Business Advisory, so just to contribute, you know. Uh, until a few years ago, as I recall, you know, there was this vision you know, of how to connect the two sides of the Pacific to prepare for the Asia-Pacific century. You know, how to improve the standards of living, you know, in Asia to be more or less similar to that, you know, of the North America. Okay. Now, China basically promoted the idea of IAFTA at that time, ASEAN plus three. And then Japan, not too comfortable with the dominating position of China, suggested you know, that three other democracies should be invited. So it's CPR. You know, so CPR, which became now RCEP. You know, and then the ASEAN basically now is the core you know, of the RCEP instead of China. You know, I think China only a few years ago agreed you know, to merge IAFTA and CPR and then you know, to promote you know, this uh, uh, idea of uh, uh, RCEP or CPR. Now, you know, during the APEC 
a business advisory council session this idea of FTEP, free trade agreement of the Asia Pacific, you know, was debated. You know, and I, I recall, you know, that for the first time the U.S. came to support the idea in Hanoi. President George Bush said, "Okay, you know, we will think about it." You know, at that time, you know, and then Obama, you know, actually in Singapore came to agree to support, you know, the idea of P4 to be expanded to become, you know, a, a TPP. Now, you know, going to the RCEP, you know, you talk about the leadership. I think in in Asia, in East Asia, the economic integration is a bit unique because for as far as you allow ASEAN to be the core of the economic regionalism, ASEAN doesn't want, or ASEAN wants to see pluralism of power. Okay, so it's basically trying to get economic integration through consensus, you know, so there is no bullet train, there is no predominant power, there is, you know, basically no emporium, but, you know, through a consensus, through a framework, you know, which is developed, you know, by way of dialogue, by way of workshop. So it's going to be a long process, mm -hmm. and therefore, you know, the aim is not all that high as TPP. But to me, again, going back to the issue, these two should be building blocks, you know, toward the Asia-Pacific century, or, you know, the Pacific dream, as, you know, John Kerry put it, you know, last week in Tokyo. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, over there. Uh, my name is uh, <clears throat> my name is Yi Jae Hyun from the ASEAN Institute. I'm in charge of the Center for uh, uh, ASEAN and Oceania Studies. Um, I got the um, <clears throat> comment add on the Professor uh, Ann mentioned on TPP and uh, uh, RCEP. Um, basically, TPP and RCEP was a, a kind of a scheme for economic integration in East Asia or. Asia Pacific, but the, the basic natures are different in a, in a way. Um, if you look at the RCEP, it is kind of you know, the uh, quite politically driven economic integration scheme in East Asia. Um, the, the following the ASEAN's past record, the, the final goal or the level of economic integration through the RCEP will be quite low. But um, it's easy to make an agreement on RCEP among the, um, the member countries. But on the other hand, TPP is a, a kind of, you know, it has set very high standard as, a, as a, a, a one of the um, speaker mentioned. So for the member countries, it will be very hard to make an agreement on all of that. Um, I think only the US and New Zealand and also Australia and Canada will be very comfortable with, the, with that kind of you know, high standard. But the rest of the other countries, maybe Singapore can be included, included in that, but the rest of other countries will, be, will have some trouble to sign all that uh, high standard. So um, for TPP, it will be very difficult to agree. But once it's agreed, it will have a, you know, a significant economic impact on the region. And if I would like, uh, if I add one more thing on the um, RCEP, I, um, whenever I think about the RCEP, I um, kind of, uh, mm, it reminds me something that the, a, a few years ago, Indonesian foreign minister actually mentioned that uh, dynamic equilibrium in East Asia. The basic concept of dynamic equilibrium is to um, have more, multilateral institutions in the region so that no single country can take the hegemony, hegemony in the, um, every uh, field of uh, cooperation. So the, um, when uh, there are um, uh, 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 East Asia uh, free trade uh, area and the um, uh, CEPIA, TPP, and the ASEAN is proposing another concept, RCEP. So the multiple kind of you know, institutions for economic integration so that no one can take the uh, uh, leadership or hegemony in the region for in the field of economic integration. Thank you. Okay, so there is... Hi, um, hi my name is Youngmin. I'm a former intern at the Asan Institute and uh, 
I know we've been talking about the prospect of TPP versus um, the RCEP um, with regard to the frictions between economic incentives and political incentives. I'm curious to know, um, in the context of uh, the three countries in East Asia and the leadership transitions that been, that's been taking place, um, how that colors the prospects um, for each of these trade negotiations, if at all. Um. Okay, so kind of impact of uh, leadership change in you know uh, Northeast Asian countries uh, on the uh, shape kind of the, the prospects uh, for the uh, regional economic integration. Okay, yes. Dr. Uh, as we all know that uh, the leadership change is still unfolding in terms of how those new leaders set up their team mm. and what kind of a policy. Uh, but it is uh, critical for those leaders to uh, be able to get together uh, to discuss issues. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, there are already uh, a set of meetings uh, took place and uh, some planning stage uh, continue. Uh, it, it's ongoing negotiations. Uh, it seems like uh, uh, if we look at the each individual countries, uh, early this morning mentioned uh, US-China, namely Obama, Xi Jinping, uh, the people expect that they would uh, meet within this year and have more negotiation, and not only on strategic uh, but also on economic terms. Uh, that's one of the tasks of the uh, so-called uh, strategic and economic uh, dialogue. And na naturally, the economic issue will be part of that. Uh, the difficult part is still CJK. Uh, because of this uh, regional uh, territory and the political and other uh, friction, uh, it is said, for example, reported the next month scheduled the uh, East Asia CJK summit, uh, Pa Hai, Li Keqiang, and Abe now postponed uh, to an uncertain future. Uh, this kind of occasion uh, would be very good for those new leaders to meet. Uh, uh, but I understand that uh, uh, all those uh, new leaders, uh, Pa Hai, Xi Jinping, and Abe, uh, they would like to have some kind of reform oriented and emphasizing regional issue as well. Uh, but it really depends on there are also domestic constraints uh, among others. Uh, so I guess w one may only wish that uh, they may overcome some kind of obstacles and then we'll meet together and to tangle this very important regional integration issue. Yeah. Uh, on the leadership yeah. changes, mm -hmm. I would argue that so far they've been negative for um, CJK, as we've seen when the cancellation of the visit, I mean, of this summit. This is a big step um, and positive for TPP because it sounds like Abe is pushing harder uh, than NODA was for this issue. Um, and Xi Jinping has not announced economic reforms, they may still be coming, that would have given more impetus for uh, regional integration, a sense that China is preparing some of the reforms that people have long discussed as necessary. So uh, right now, and also the tensions aroused by increased nationalism generated by both Xi Jinping and Abe suggest to me that we're not getting an improved atmosphere for regional integration within East Asia. Maybe I can, okay, I can add a brief point. Uh, but if you think about the Korea, China, then although we have a leadership change, the, the new leadership toward the Korea, China FTA are probably stronger than <laughs> the previous leadership. So uh, here we have much more reason uh, to have the, the successful conclusion. Yeah. 
Because if you think about uh, North Korea issue, uh, the, the, the Japan's uh, strategic move toward this exchange rate, and uh, many, many things. So, uh, so that, that's why I mentioned that this Korea-China FTA may be a key <coughs> to all this subsequent the FTA uh, race or competition or cooperation, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, personally, uh, and I'm in total agreement with Dr. Zhou, uh, I hoped uh, that uh, at the uh, Twilight of Summit meeting, uh, which was supposed to be hosted by uh, Korea yeah. uh, in May uh, this year, uh, since we have a lady president. So I think uh, President Park geun uh, I, I thought that uh, you know, would uh, uh, assume a you know, very important role uh, to uh, kind of uh, uh, accommodate you know, and to kind of uh, reduce uh, tension uh, between and China and Japan. But unfortunately, uh, with the you know, a recent uh, event, uh, what happened in, uh, in Japan, uh, kind of provoked uh, China so China wanted to delay the, uh, the trilateral uh, summit meeting. Uh, it's quite unfortunate. Uh, okay, so I th yeah, just one more question. Yeah. Uh, I'm Qin Sheng from Chinese Academy of Social Science. Uh, I have one question for Rose. Uh, since you mentioned about the factors, uh, mainly three, I think, uh, about the economy, the, the safe and safety, and the culture, and which influence the uh, integration of East Asia. And I want to know that since uh, now the situation is not very good, especially on safety and culture part. So, uh, so that means we have a dark future in the integration of East Asia, or do you think there's uh, some, uh, we can only have successful end uh, those three factors simultaneously, mm -hmm. I mean, the requirements meet simultaneously, we can only get success. The prospect of increasing economic integration is in every country's interest. And therefore, I wouldn't say it's a dark future in terms of more efforts to strengthen economic ties and find ways of boosting FTAs and the like. But if you say, is there, in terms of trying to create a community, do we have more or less consensus about the security and cultural prerequisites for that community, I think the future does not look good right now. The future has turned substantially darker in the last four or five years towards creating a sense of community with common interests, and I think the cultural identity factor is a huge part of it. That China had a wonderful opportunity to strengthen a sense of a kind of common Confucian, East Asian traditional culture, but instead Confucianism became focused much more on solidifying sort of the solidarity of the party and supporting a kind of image of an idealized Chinese past and harmonious tradition with the region and not dealing with the concerns of surrounding countries. And that, in my mind, has reduced the prospect of community. And right now, I would say, I don't see any alternative to an Asia-Pacific community. That will be the strongest element of community ahead because I don't see how it can be forged around a Chinese notion of community. That's my worry about economic integration, not carrying over into other re areas. Okay, Dr. Yes. Zhou. Uh, I guess so far we have addressed many uh, negative and uh, not so optimistic uh, elements which I fully agree that there are obstacles, but I may have to add a, a optimistic element uh, for the past few years. Uh, we do see uh, cultural and educational exchanges mm. among countries uh, has increased. 
Uh, so I guess those really a optimistic mm. part uh, of this, you know, regional CJK in particular, but also include Southeast Asia. I remember even during the low part of China-Japan relations, that is Koizumi time, uh, Koizumi proposed a student exchange uh, program uh, and passed by Japanese style, uh, I mean, uh, uh, parliament, if I remember correctly, uh, and then started momentum, and also China, Korea supported that move. We now see uh, students move to each country, pay short and midterm visit from two weeks to six months, uh, have homestay and others. Uh, when I talk with Chinese students, for example, who spend some time at the KO, at the uh, Waseda, and Toda, and from Peking University, Fudan University, they are in general positive. They have a good impression, and I guess this younger generation uh, would move up with a better understanding each other, uh, so that would lay a foundation. And this is also an experience for uh, European Union. Uh, the students exchange between uh, France and Germany really played the foundation and laid the foundation for the EU uh, establishment. Okay, so time is up. So I'd like to uh, conclude this panel uh, on the optimistic note of Dr. Zhao for the uh, future <laughs> of East Asian economic integration. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking uh, four panelists for their excellent contribution.